Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 1552 to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. And by the Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1, my new book, featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know, Available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Well, Matthew and Gunnar Nelson have rare insights into what is take what it takes to earn longevity in the entertainment world. They continue the inspiring story of a most remarkable show business family. Their grandparents, Ozzy and Harriet, achieved immortality with the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, the longest running live action sitcom in television history. Earlier, the couple had enjoyed big band success and had scored a number of number one hits in 1934. Long before MTV made twins, Matthew and Gunner pop rock icons, Ozzy Nelson is credited with creating the first conceptual music video for Ricky Nelson's Traveling Man. After the Rain was the debut multi-platinum album by Nelson, and they zoomed to number one with their hit song, Can't Live Without Your Love and Affection, which made history landing America's iconic Nelson family into the Guinness Book of World Records as the only family in entertainment with three successive generations of number one hit makers. Nelson's After the Rain record and tour became a phenomenon just prior to the rise of grunge. The last major success of the good time rock and roll era, Nelson has had number one, uh, four top tens and five top 40 Billboard Hot 100 singles, plus five number one MTV videos, and has sold over 6.5 million albums worldwide. Every magazine from Rolling Stone to People did cover stories, and Nelson performed on television shows shows like Late Night with David Letterman and Saturday Night Live. Nelson has always been synonymous with entertainment in America. Matthew and Gunner follow Ozzy Nelson's vision of embracing, connecting with people and audiences through all forms of media. They have been doing television hosting work for VH1 and E. Plus, Gunner co-hosted Lifetime Radio's nationally syndicated morning show. Nelson's, Nelson has been headlining, headlining at major rock festivals around the globe, celebrating their 20th anniversary of After the Rain, touring in China, the UK, and of course, the US, where they have also toured extensively with Peter Frampton and Styx. Please welcome American singer, songwriter, musician, who, with his twin brother Gunnar Nelson, is a member of the multi-platinum selling band Nelson and son of legendary rock and roll singer and pioneer Ricky Nelson, Matthew Nelson. Hello, Matthew. Uh, hello, how are you doing? I, I that was a, quite a spiel. That was, uh, <laughs> this is your life, and the only the only thing that I have to comment on that is I can't believe it. It hasn't been twenty years since our After the Rain record. It's the thirtieth anniversary. Oh wow! So it means I'm a little bit older. Isn't that great? That's great. That's uh, wonderful news. <laughs> yeah. Still around, having a good time, uh, loving making music, and uh, still still out there when we get a chance to play, and still writing music, which is the most important thing. My wife and I were huge fans of Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, I think we saw every episode when it was featured on the Disney Channel at one time. Uh, sure. My father-in-law's mannerisms, who he's not with us anymore, was exactly 
like Ozzy. I mean, you could have said that was Ozzy's twin. So I really identify uh, with, with your family a lot. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, Grandpa Ozzy was just a, a great guy. I was only 10 when he passed. But, yeah. Uh, I did get a chance to really know him and hang out with him, and I really knew his heart. And I got to tell you, I never in my life heard more stories, of course, for my dad, but more stories about people that had encounters or worked with him that adored the man so much. You know, he was a really bright guy, brighter than people who ever came before me. He wrote, produced, edited, directed, starred in all 435 episodes of the show, was a band leader, and had a law degree. So it was, um, he was just one of those guys, still a record for the youngest Eagle Scout in Boy Scouts history, you know, back when it meant something. And he just kind of had one of those um, can-do attitudes. He was a really, really great guy to learn from. You know, one of the, uh, I guess, trivia questions was, what did he? What, what was his job actually during? You know, in the show, I, I thought was he an insurance agent playing? A, <laughs> <with an air? laughs> well, I, I, he was just Mister Fall Off the Ladder and Make Harriet Look Good guy. Uh, no, he, he actually, uh, he always said that he was a retired band leader. And uh, obviously, you know, when when the show started, it was 1952, I believe, on television. And it was so new back then that, that Ozzy honestly thought that they were going to get back out and start singing again. You know, he thought it was kind of an extension of the radio show. And uh, they didn't have pilot TV shows, so they made a film uh, to see if the Nelsons worked on screen called Here Come the Nelsons for Universal. And it right. was a success. And uh, he always used to joke that he always thought that he was going to get back out on the road and, and be a singer with his wife. And, and the show just kept on getting renewed. And then when our dad started singing, he kind of, I think that was his okay. I guess it's time for me to really, truly live vicariously through my son. And he kind of became one of the first uh, record co-producers. You know, my dad and, and Ozzy, kind of, uh, we have all the tapes. We can hear all the, the back and forth but in the studio glass. There were no record producers. They made it up as they went along with rock and roll being so new. So it was nice for Grandpa. He never he never really, you know, when we talked to Grandma Harriet, who I was really close to, mm-hmm. they always thought that music was the through line of the Nelson family. And the irony there is it's America's favorite television Family. It definitely is. I, 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 I'm kind of friends with the Livingstons, you know, Stanley and Barry from My True sure. Sons, and of course Barry was on uh, uh, many episodes of uh, of the show. Uh, uh-huh. Got to talk to him, and and also um, uh, Ray Walker from the Jordanaires used to have some stories about your about your dad because he, he of also, course. yeah. Great people all, and uh, the, the thing that's really neat, you know, sometimes I talk to, I talk to uh, a lot of people that worked on the show. Of mm-hmm. course, James Burton I'm in touch with, a great guitar player that played with Elvis and our dad, and Amazing. a bunch of other people. Emmy yeah. Lou, uh, still talk to him, but also Kent McCord, if you remember Adam 12. I sure do. Uh, yeah, Kent was uh, really, uh, probably our father's best friend, and, you know, he was called Kent McWhorter on the television show, uh-huh. and he was going through things and learning how to act, he'd come out of football and whatever. I talked to Kent a lot, and what a sweethearted guy. We got some great stories about stuff that used to happen on and off the set, and again, it's the same thing. Everybody just has so much um, love for that that family, because it was really, if you think about it, there were 435 episodes of the show on television, more than that on radio, running for 14 years on TV, and they had a really insular kind of group of people. You know, our dad and our family, they were popular. That um, You know, it was a different era. Everybody knew where the soundstage was. People could walk right up to them. I never saw our dad or, or my grandparents ever have, like, kind of celebrity moments. Right. Um, it was just a kind of a, a kinder time, but it's like when our father passed away so young. He was only 45, but people still kind of come up to me and it was like losing a family member. You yeah. know, they, they say, yeah. I remember where I was. When when Kennedy, uh, when the Kennedy thing happened, when we lost Elvis, and of course lost your father, mm-hmm. and um, it's really neat that our family had such an impact. It, it's true. I was I was depressed for weeks after your dad passed away because I was a big Ricky Nelson fan. You know, I think that he was the closest thing to Elvis. You know, he even had that Elvis kind of personality. You know, and the charisma that he had. Sure, he- he definitely had the same charisma. The yeah. irony there, I think, was that they both were fabulously looking guys. They right. both oozed the charisma and sexuality and sensuality. But the thing was, Elvis was a the, the quintessential extrovert. Mm-hmm. Ricky was Ricky was an introvert. Right. Elvis came at you. Yep. 
Rick, Ricky drew you in. Yeah. And I think they both really worked. You know, um, there was a great quote in a show that we put together. It was uh, somebody that said, Elvis turned off a lot of parents. Ricky didn't. Pat Boone turned off a lot of mm. kids. Ricky didn't. That's true. So he was just, yeah, he was just yeah. one of those guys that it was real deal music and, and all that just different styles. But they, they loved each other, my dad and Elvis. Elvis was kind of like his older brother. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, there was only one guy that kind of gave Elvis a run for the money. And it was Ricky Nelson. It was Ricky, yeah. You know, I couldn't believe how many hits Pat Boone had. I mean, I, I didn't realize he was that that popular back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. And, um, you know, I've, I've met Mr. Boone a few times and uh -huh. stuff like that. I just know that, uh, you know, completely different sensibilities. Yep. You know, our, our, our dad was a closet greaser. And right. the people that knew him, especially with his early music, I mean, he the Hollywood rockabilly. His his best friends were Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. Yep. You know, it was yeah. a West Coast kind of thing, and and uh, you know, uh, Pat Boone didn't figure any of that. They, you know, had real deal rockabilly bands, and and there were kids, and they were making straight up music that uh, was what kids were into. I mean, Pop really wanted to be Kirk Perkins. That was his hero. Yep. And um, all his life, he only got to meet him right before he passed away, and. You know, Carl looked at him and said, well, Ricky, it looks like we're the last two rockabillies left. You know, I mean, that was really the heart and soul of, of our father's music. Even even going through uh, his reimagining and his rebirth as a, as, a, as a songwriter and a country rocker with the mm -hmm. whole Stone Canyon band thing, right, which I right. adore. And I was there when that happened. Mm -hmm. It was um, a really interesting career. And I, I love talking about it just because I'm so proud of him. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, your band. Uh, did did you, your band actually started where you were the lead singer, and then Gunner learned to play the guitar? Is that what happened in the beginning? Yeah, it really was. Uh -huh. I mean, there's some stuff floating around uh, you know, on YouTube. You can see where we were the only unsigned artist to ever sing on Saturday Night Live. Right. Way back when. Yep. I remember Ron Reagan Jr. was the co-host and stuff. Um I mean, John Lovitz was in the cast. I remember all that stuff, but I was actually fronting the band. Gunner mm -hmm. was playing drums. He was a fabulous drummer. Uh, we had gotten booked, actually, when the uh, the talent booker for the show bought a, a, one of our gigs in Hollywood before our father passed away, and we were really pumped to play the show. And then, mm -hmm. of course, the accident happened, and um, I think, you know, we did a little tribute song on the Billboard Music Award, actually it was uh, the American Music Awards for our dad, and decided that we were going to continue and play the show, and we knew that people were going to look at it going, oh, this is a little bit a little bit odd, and um, we did, a, I think we did a fine job, but on the way home, Gunner didn't look right, we both, were both completely screwed up, I mean, our dad was our best friend, and yep. yeah, I have to call it like a football game, it's too personal, but right. we were supposed to be on the plane with him. Really? And, uh, huh. You know, we, you know, he just, uh, he, he changed his mind at the last minute, like he had a pre premonition. And yeah. the bottom line was Gunner and I were just not ready. We knew it was going to happen, even though we've been playing since we were six and did the nightclub thing. And, and it was like, Gunner just said, look, Matt, I don't feel good. I got to get my head together. And I said, I kind of do. So, and he said, I, I'm coming off the drums and I'm going to learn how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And I lost my mind. So, you know, it's like years and years and years. Of, it wasn't a matter of ego of me wanting to front. I just thought, he didn't even play a chord, and he said, I promise you, give me one year, and I will not not have a guitar in my hand. I'm going to play every day, and by the end of that year, I'm going to be as good as somebody that plays occasionally for 10 years. That's amazing. And yeah. I didn't really have a choice, and yeah. to be honest with you, to his credit, he was correct, and he actually really surprised me. And when we really got into the final phases of singing, you know, we were really into songwriting, because we knew that we needed to write our own hits, nobody was going to give them to mm -hmm. us, and... Uh, when we were demoing the songs, I'll never forget that day. Uh, there was a song where Gunner, his range seemed to work really well for this song, right. and I had this natural ability to sing harmony up above. After years and years of me fronting, and all of a sudden we just looked at each other and went, "That's the sound. That's it." You know, we we knew that was the the, the quintessential. You know, you can flash through a radio channel and in five seconds know that's those guys, and so that's where that sound was born, really. Now, being you guys are identical twins, right? We are. Yeah, yeah. I I, I can uh, identify with that. My dad's an identical twin. I have a granddaughter. They're identical twins. We we have a lot of twins in our family as well. But all right, do, do you guys uh the, the sound being an identical twin? Do your voices differ, or are they very very similar? Do you think? I think they're very different. They're different. Um, 
sense, I, I tend to be able to sing a ballad in a lower register a lot more like my father. Right. So, like, when we do, uh, we have a show we put together called Ricky and Elster Remembered, where it's a retrospective on our dad and our memories with him and his exactly. songs and his life and stuff. And right. I tend to sing those songs. Not that I'm trying to imitate him, it's just that I can sing those songs like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gunner, Gunner tends to have a bit more, I call it the enchilada. He's got more of that kind of rock and roll grit to his voice. And I also, uh, funny enough, have that kind of Randy Meisner tenor yep. where I can sing the high harmony notes and stuff. And uh, I get hired to do that a lot on people's records. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of developed that way. But I, you can definitely hear, if we're trying to sing the same song, a real difference in our voices. I, here's the weird thing, though. As identical twins, if I have to pop a line in in a, in a recording and be my brother, I can't be. Huh. And the same thing with him. So um, it, when we allow ourselves just to, to have our own personalities, they're very identifiable. But we can be chameleons, too, if we have to be. It happens occasionally. Yeah. You, you guys had some issues uh, with record companies. I know you started out with, was it Geffen? Geffen Records? It was Geffen. It was, it was actually DGC. We, we okay. got signed to Geffen. And then uh, right before, you know, they had us on ice for a few years. And, you know, it was a few years of trying to get that deal with John Collager there. Right. Uh, who was Bill Powerhouse and our guy. Uh, when it came time to release our first album, you know, you have to wait for that release window and everybody else got priority. Um, they said, we're going to deal with this new offshoot label with a whole different staff of people. Now, Geffen was the, the, the major player in yep. the business at the time. And when they said, oh, we're just going to move you over to our offshoot label with a, a promotional staff that is new. And I'm thinking, well, that's, we've sealed our fate. Nothing's going to happen. And, we, we thought it was, you know, a death blow to us before we even got out of the gate. There were a lot of false starts, but the reality of it was, you know, everything kind of lined up. We got a chance to uh, host uh, what they called Dial MTV, which is the call-in show mm-hmm. on on MTV that uh, was TRL or whatever, where they voted in their, their favorite videos for kids, and uh, it turned out that the people kind of appreciated our, our hosting, and by the end of the week, they surprised us, and we had uh, the number one video in the country with love and affection on its first day from uh and it wasn't from ads it was it was from kids calling in exactly. so yeah. that was a really neat thing we we just kind of were one of those we were very fortunate to have fans that were yep. that really dug what we were doing do you think it, it kind of hurt in a way i guess they didn't really promote i think that third it was it the third album uh, because they can uh, wasn't promoted like it should have been. It, was that a, kind of a blow for you guys, or? Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't promoted like it should have been. It was. It was not promoted at all. And I, I'm going to give you a little. Huh. You know, a lot of bands say, "Oh, they didn't promote it." Uh, a week before we released the album, right. after a couple of years of, uh, you know, agenda change over at Geffen or DGC, you know, mm-hmm. Nirvana broke on the label. Yep. Anything that wasn't from Seattle was getting. You know, if you weren't Sonic Youth or Nirvana. <clears throat> uh, quote here from Gunner I found saying he was proud of the record uh, I think it's a great record for what it is but I was given the mandate by uh, is it John uh, Kaladner or Kaladner um, 
Kalodner. Kalodner. Okay. John Kalodner. Yeah. But you're not it. you're not allowed to play any crunchy guitar on this record at all. It's got to be acoustic and or in uh, organic, and that's it. I mean, that's that's it. Yep. That's, that's, that's exactly one hundred percent true. Well, now why is this? Why why did he take that stance? Um, I think it was maybe his John Kalodner. He really had something. I mean, he, he discovered a lot of great bands and he signed ACDC originally. Mm-hmm. He put Aerosmith back together. I mean, his right. track record was amazing, but he's the kind of guy that would say to a songwriter, like me, hey, uh, there's something wrong with the chorus. And I would say, well, uh, can you tell me what it is? What bothers you about the chorus? And he would say, I don't know. You're the songwriter. You figure it out. <laughs> and it was like that. So, you know, it's kind of a mystery uh, to be able to, to, to kind of get what he was going for. But I think around that time, he just felt that there was such a backlash on any uh, guitar-oriented, like, you know, again, he had come out of mm-hmm. uh, White Snake and Aerosmith, right. and everything that wasn't, you know, it, he just knew that we weren't going to be really accepted as a, a grunge band because we weren't one. We were mm-hmm. basically a heavy pop folk kind of thing, and he sure. always saw us as the new Hollies, which is not far off, to be honest with you. And... um you know, we were our folky, the California country guys with heavy guitars and the other way around. So I think it was just his way of trying to give us uh, an artistic shot in that climate. And I think, honestly, in hindsight, he meant well. He just didn't say what he meant well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Because They Can album, we wound up finishing with our friend John Oyland, who had produced our father in the uh, late 60s and put actually put the Eagles together to mm-hmm. back Linda Ronstadt. Oh, cool. And, yeah. you know, so he had done Order Flash and the first two Boston albums. And he was a very, very well-known producer, but that was his, uh, his mandate was, you know, no heavy guitar, got to be more kind of like, you know, country folk or whatever. And to be honest with you, we made an amazingly good album and they had no idea what to do with it. It was, it was right as the Garth Brooks boom was happening, sure. except we were on a pop label, pop, pop rock label, and uh, we actually wound up finding our way to Nashville in '95, mm-hmm. kind of at the end of that whole Garth thing, with all the songwriters in Nashville that were big at the time saying, "You know what you guys naturally do is exactly where we are." So uh, we kind of never left, really emotionally. We made a lot of other albums and stuff, but that's kind of a. Uh, it was very close. Uh, like a heavier version of the Stone Canyon band was kind of where we naturally sit. You know, with all the country artists today, I mean, I would have thought you guys would have been like at the top of the list, you know, because you guys are so freaking talented. You, you oh, know, you. You, you got the, you got the gimmick of being twins, you know, good looking guys and everything. I mean, you, you beat anything out there country wise today, I, I think. Well, I appreciate it. Well, Gunnar and I actually have been, uh, in this time, finishing up, especially this year, uh, our our project called Firstborn Sons, and it actually is a culmination of everything we've learned in Nashville, all the songs we've uh, written with a focus on, kind of like when everybody hopefully goes back to seeing concerts and being around people, which I think there's going to be, if you look at history, Mm -hmm. kind of like a natural nihilism that's going to happen, and we're going to rebel against the lockdowns and stuff and want to go to see shows, we put together something we call Arena Country. And it's not like a Florida Georgia Line thing where it's, you know, rapid country. It's not what we do. It's like, um, you know, Eagles meets Joe Walsh meets Almond Brothers with hit songs, you know, and uh, I think people that are fans of, of uh, 80s rock and guitar music plus country music are really gonna really gonna like this and I think it was just a matter of time I mean Gunnar and I shot it at country we got signed to Warner Reprise here mm-hmm. we got signed by three different women at three different labels and shot down without hearing any music at all by three different guys who thought oh they're not gonna think it's real it's like they didn't even listen to music so it's kind of the family tradition I think of right. being underestimated and misunderstood <laughs> and it breaks out it works so we're looking forward to next year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you're going to do well. I really do. Well, thank you. I, I think the music is, is fantastic. We've got uh, a man named Chris Lord Algy, who's kind of my favorite mixer of all time. He's, he's done our singles for Firstborn Sons. And, uh-huh. you know, when people hear it, uh, you know, I, I remember I played it for our, our music business attorney. He's been in this business for almost 50 years, one of the top guys. And he, I don't think he even... Uh, expected it. We kind of kept it under wraps. We played it for him, a song called Saturday Night. 
and he listened to it on his headphones, and then he just looked and he said, I'm stunned. I'm staggered by this. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of, you want a reaction like that, you know? It can't just be good. It's got to be undeniably, like, exceptional. Right. And I think we've got it. You know, it's so hard today. I mean, you know, record companies aren't like what they used to be. You know, there's no A&R guys anymore like there used to be. Uh, yeah, all, all they do is kind of push the Katy Perry's and Taylor Swift's, you know, the, the female solo singers. Uh, there's a lot of dancing in the acts now. There's not a lot of bands anymore, which pisses me off. <laughs> well, yeah, it's kind of like that. I mean, what I've seen now is a big book to, uh, I mean, the reality of the industry has always been every every quarter of major labels going to pick one artist or band to push. Yeah. That's who's going to get it. Not. We never got that nod. We right. went through in spite of that. I mean, like we, for instance, 30 years ago, we had the number one record in the country and didn't get any tour, tour support at all from our, uh, we had to finance it through t-shirt sales. That's and crazy. you do what you got to do and I wouldn't yeah. take it back. However, uh, now it's even, it's different than that. It's, you know, are you on an idol? Uh, how many followers do you have on your social media? I mean, it's not even a matter of music or somebody listening to something going, wow, that's just exceptional. I love that. I'm going to take a shot. I want to cultivate it and build it. It's it just, that doesn't happen really a whole lot anymore. It does with, I guess, reimagining and revitalizing legacy artists, you know, and, and I guess Gunnar and I follow, you fall into that, that category, but I have a lot of people that come to me and say, hey, I, I love music and I really want to get something going. And you see that it's it's a whole different world out there now of, you know, the clicks on your social media is all that matters. It doesn't even have to be good. It just has to kind of be uh, be in the lexicon. And it's a little bit more here today, hot tamale. I, I don't know if they're going to be an awful lot of uh, artists, you know, legacy artists in the future. I don't think you know so. I mean? No. I agree with you 100%. It, yep. We'll see what happens. I mean... Everybody used to say, I saw this great thing with David Bowie, uh, it, was an, it was an interview, and it was somebody, it was right when the internet was really starting to move, you know, people were really more into downloads and stuff like that, and, and uh, Napster just happened, and somebody said to him, well, what do you think about the internet as a great way of delivering music? And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, I am really excited and terrified at the same time. Yeah. And he said, well, what do you, it's just a way of delivering music. He said, no, no, no. This whole thing is a whole lot bigger than you think it is, both good and bad. And he said, we haven't even begun to know what we've let out of the box. Yeah. And I think, he's, you know, we're kind of living that now. And uh, as cool as it is to be able to have access to a lot of things, you know, there are a lot of there's a lot of artists and music that's getting kind of uh, put down in a search window or kind of excommunicated if they say the wrong thing and all that stuff. That, as a, as an artist, scares the crap out of you. Yeah. Um, but all you can do is kind of move forward. And, you know, Gunnar and I have three rules we live by regardless of what happens in the world or with our music. You know, it's number one, be undeniably good. Number two, don't lose your sense of humor because you're going to need it. Mm-hmm. That was actually right out of my dad's mouth. Right. And number three, don't be a jerk. Although <laughs> yeah. you can substitute that last word. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that, yeah. that will do you well. And, and don't speak out about politics, which pisses me off. Because, you know, why come out and, and you know, like bash somebody in politics? You're going to lose half your audience or even more of your audience. And, you know, Johnny Carson always said that. He said, why, why should I tell everybody my political views and lose, you know, uh, an audience? It doesn't make any sense. And, and Well, Grandpa Ozzy used to say the same thing. It's like, yeah. I, you know, I mean, of course, I have my beliefs both ways, but to never bring up religion or politics because yeah. you're going to lose half your crowd immediately. Sure. Yeah. And the whole point of music and entertainment, in my opinion, at its best is communion and right. bringing people together, not right. necessarily segregating. We have enough of that. And, you know, I know as a per- just as a human being, I really could give a crap what a, what a, uh, the actor says in Hollywood right. about their, you know, their politics. Sure. You right. know, I don't care. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I hate to say it, there's a little, and, and again, you have a whole family of actors and stuff. I mean, the only exception I gotta say lately is, you know, my Uncle Mark is doing an amazing job mm-hmm. on NCIS, you right. know, right. and he runs a great, great show. He produces it, he does all that kind of stuff, but he's a very successful man with an incredible reach and he's extremely careful and we've talked about it a lot about, mm-hmm. you know, not getting involved in all of that stuff because you're gonna, somebody, you know, especially nowadays, somebody's offended about everything. Exactly. But, you know, he's done a good job about that, but, you know, I just, unfortunately, 
unfortunately saw this really unfortunate article about the band Hanson mm-hmm. being canceled by their fans for, mm-hmm. you know, not doing this or not doing that or whatever. I'm just like, where are we? This is like, yeah. sometimes I feel like I wake up and I'm living in a video game that I can't get out of. That's a cross <laughs> between a science fiction novel and a divorce court. It's bizarre. It's a you Twilight know? Zone. <laughs> it, it is a Twilight Zone. But, you know, again, um, I do. I'm one of those people that, in spite of everything that you're seeing, I choose not to live in a perpetual state of fear. And I always have to, you know, listen to, to my heart and, you know, other things that tell me what's right and wrong. And other than that, you just, you know, take every day as it comes and, and, you know, try to, try to be the solution and not the problem. Yeah. You know, we're also proud of your sister, Tracy, man. She's, she's done some amazing things. And of course, you know, what always stands out is that, uh, Seinfeld episode. <laughs> I love the Seinfeld episode. Yeah, she's cool. I still talk to Tracy every once in a while. You know, we're, um, you know, it's been a one for a crazy year for everybody, Mm -hmm. you know, this year. And she's living right in the middle of, uh, you know, where I moved from, which is, you know, North Hollywood. Right. And, and I'm living in Tennessee. We couldn't have really, uh, more different areas just from, from a geographical uh, point of view and, and every point of view and stuff and it's neat to have Tracy over there and somebody I can talk to and stuff I mean you know I'll always have California uh, you know I was born and raised there mm-hmm. you know kind of back when it was a very different type of uh, environment and very stuff different. and yeah. um, I just uh, I, I'll, I'll always miss my home a little bit because it'll always be a part of that for me and I'll always miss my family that's still there yep well you know for, for the audience that you know I, I want to remind them Tracy was uh, I mean, she's done so many roles in television. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But one of my favorites when she was um, uh, George Costanza's, uh, everybody said she looked like Jerry. In yeah, that there was that, that kind of latent, uh, what is George <laughs> up to? Because he, he's like, I, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. And at the end, she'd gotten her hair cut. She was exactly like <laughs> That was funny. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a great show. She did a great job on School Pegs, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Going way back, that TV show was awesome. She was in Down and Out in Beverly Hills yep. with Richard Dreyfuss and Bette Midler. Uh, and I think like, you know, a jillion Lifetime movies. You know, she's a hard worker. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's very good at what she does, and uh, I uh, I always feel, you know, I'm always saying my prayer for, for work, for mm-hmm. especially for women in Hollywood. Right. You know, it's just really tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's very, regardless of what they say, it's really dependent on a lot on, on her age. And, you know, uh, my Aunt Pam, Mark's, Mark's wife, uh, Pam Dauber, she mm-hmm. said, you know, you usually go, for, you're like, you're the hot babe, and then you go to the hot babe mom, and then the hot babe's grandma. That's yeah, basically that's true. how they cast women, and yeah. and I think that's unfair. But um, you know, there's I, sh- I got to say that Tracy's a very smart person, mm-hmm. and uh, she makes very very intelligent choices as an actress. I, I got to ask you about your ZZ Top period. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Which one? The long beards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever had a long beard. Gunner did. Did, but, did, uh, did you both guys have a beard at one time? No, uh, uh-uh, no, I, I actually, you know, that's the one thing is like, I, I certainly wish that I could grow a great looking beard, but, you know, when I do that, I kind of start looking a little bit like, well, you know, Robert Redford, which isn't so bad, but I'm good with a scruff. I can do, I can pull off scruff. I can't really pull off a beard. Gunner actually has a, a, a bit of a, kind of a Fu Manchu work in a little okay. bit, you know, a little bit. Gunner can look like Buffalo Bill pretty good. He can pull that off, you know. But uh, I never did. I never really did that. I mean, I, I've actually kind of. I had much shorter hair for about twenty five years after right. uh, the first couple of Nelson albums. I really cut my hair short, and um, just now kind of let it. I've let it grow a little bit in this kind of era mm-hmm. of why not? Sure. And uh, I kind of missed it. To yeah. be honest with you. Yeah, you guys look pretty cool. I mean, you know, the long hair thing. I I, I don't remember. Uh, Look alike, uh, long haired blondes since Johnny and Edgar Winter. <laughs> That's true. And, and we are, you know, we're closing in on that a little bit. But, yeah. um, it's, it's kind of fun that, that, you know, and I definitely kind of learned about presenting some sort of a look. Um, you know, our philosophy is, you know, I never wanted to go see a concert and look at somebody that looks the plumber is there to fix the pipe. 
type. You know, I kind of wanted to look like I cared. Right. It's funny that you mentioned ZZ Top. I mean, you could say, I'm a big ZZ Top fan. Mm -hmm. I got to fly with Billy Gibbons on a flight. He couldn't have been nicer, more respectful to me. But, man, do those guys always look sharp. They just They're sharp-dressed men. You know, they they look put together. You know, and uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an image. And it's really important, actually, in Europe. Mm-hmm. where Gunnar and I used to write songs and stuff like that. I mean, we kind of got called out by a couple of people before the first release of uh, After the Rain. You know, like, what are you guys going for look-wise? Is it rock bland? What are you doing? <laughs> and so we decided to kind of take that lesson and, and created a look for ourselves. And the philosophy back then was, love us or hate us, you're going to know who we were. Mm-hmm. And boy, did that come true, yeah. you know? And uh, we, you know, everybody was wearing black leather and stuff, and we went for color. Mm-hmm. You know, we were kind of like an anti-statement. And right. the record company didn't do that. We we did that. We we were okay with, with taking that shot, you know, the high boots and the coats and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we peacocked a little bit. Sure. and um, But it was okay because, um, you know, we did stand out. And here we are years later. I'm, like, looking right now at a Milton Bradley puzzle with Gunnar and I looking like hot Swedish chicks. <laughs> Not so bad. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Hot Swedish chicks. <laughs> yeah. You guys should be big in Sweden then. <laughs> we actually were. You know, we, 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 we do just fine in Europe. It's funny yeah. because um, we just went over uh, last year. We did a, a festival. It was a big hard rock festival. They wanted us to head at one of the nights, you know. And so when you hear about going to England and doing a hard rock festival and Nelson's headlining, um, you know, the first time out, we, we had to head with our own shows, and we did very well with it. And it wasn't because we wanted to or an ego thing. It's, again, we were kind of misunderstood, mm-hmm. and nobody would take us out with them to open. So that's kind of what we did when we first started. And to get that call last year to headline a festival, we didn't do a whole lot of touring in Europe back then. And I remember we got over there, and it was a, a really big indoor venue. And we were headlining this night, and all I could say was it was a flip of what our American audience was. In America, it was all female. I'm right. talking 99% chicks. Right. And and got a little bit of shade from the guys, which is okay. We, we learned how to play instruments. We wanted the chicks. There you go. Um, I have no shame about that. And then to go and play to an audience that is all black T-shirt wearing, hard rock fan males. Yeah. So whichever way they promoted it in, in – uh, in England and Europe and also in South America, it was definitely more along the lines of your classic hard rock bands mm-hmm. and getting a little bit of kind of hard rock cred that way, which is really cool. I remember sending a video home to the wife. You know, we sold out that venue and stuff, and it was all dudes singing the words back to us. And it's weird having all those guys saying, I can't wait without your love and affection, but it, it was happening. And my wife said, where are the girls? It's all dudes. I said, I know, which is surreal. So it depends. It's kind of like what happened to our dad in the States. He had a lot of success. The Ozzy and Harriet show, the end of the shows, and it was very, very female-driven and stuff. And in England and Europe, they didn't get the show there. He was just a rock star. And he was considered like Elvis or Jerry Lee or all those people. Completely different perception. Um, So it matters where you go in the world, I guess, and how they promote it. You know, I can see you guys being huge, like, you know, places like Japan and Europe and Amsterdam and, you know, uh, places like even, you know, I mean, even today, you know, I think if you did a tour out there uh, when all this crap is over with, I think you're going to be very successful out there. There's, I think so, I think so yeah. too. I mean, in Japan, for, you know, way back, you know, years ago, right. they actually had a store that was called Nelson Station. It quite literally was an entire huh. shop dedicated to us. Really? And we did commercials over there and toured over there, yeah. and we were a kind of a big deal over in Japan. And I've always wanted to go back. It's been like 25 years mm-hmm. since I've been there, I think since 95 or whatever. And I, I love Japan. I had a great time there, and I think going back kind of a little older and, you know, with a, a killer band and great songs, I, you know, it's one of my goals. And again, you're right. We'll see what happens with international travel and all this weirdness and all that stuff. I mean, who knows what's going to happen, but I'm excited about uh, the prospect of back out there in other parts of the world. You know, those guys, they, they don't forget. You know, they love the blues. They love rock and roll. You know, I, I, I think they're they're a little bit more, um, I want to say dedicated, I guess, than the Americans are, you know, long-lasting. 
you know, overseas than the and that's why there's a lot of rock stars that only perform in Europe. You know, I mean, one, one is Susie yeah. Quattro. She never moved out of England. I'm I'm friends with Susie. I talk to her from time to time, but she's oh, cool. she, she's huge over there. You know, she didn't have to come to the states. Oh, I, yeah, you know? uh, yeah. There's there's a lot of and uh, again, uh, it depends. You know, the, the way that I look at it, uh, when I you know before I knew better, I I kind of wanted to you know be the biggest band in the world. Now I kind of want to be the biggest band in my world, and I'm okay with that. Right. You know. Right. And I think that's all right. You know, it's kind of like shoot for the shoot for the sun. If you land on the moon, you're okay. Sure. And, um, we're doing fine right now, but I mean, I definitely think that that uh, if there's any indication of our reception in, in places like 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 England and stuff, that I'd love to spend more time over there. You know, I used to love going to Australia, mm-hmm. but it's it's so crazy over there right yeah. now with what's going on that that's gonna really have to shake itself out. I hope I hope I haven't been to Australia for the last time. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a shame because, you know, music just kind of turned off, which, you know, it, it's bad for everybody because, you know, we, we all survive on music, you know, that's that's our, uh, you know. That, it's our, yeah, it really is kind of our, our little solace in right. the middle of, of turmoil. Right. I mean, it's like an old friend, you know, it's yeah. like having a visit with somebody that makes you feel good. And, mm-hmm. uh, that's why I, I love it. I mean, I've been playing a lot. I've been doing a lot of these things called cameos, which, you know, yeah. people request me, you know, like doing a shout out song, but I always sing a song on these things. And uh, it's kind of given me a little bit of an ability to connect with people and, you know, hey, can you sing After the Rain and cheer me up? Yeah. Sure. You know, not a problem. It's kind of fun to be able to do that. But there's nothing like being in front of a lot of people, bringing people together. And unfortunately, if you think about it, that's probably going to be the last thing that's encouraged. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so we're going to have to see how it is. But, you know, the irony there is I think the world needs music now more than ever before. It needs communion. It needs togetherness. It needs to kind of heal that great divide that, that, uh, media seems to be promoting now. And, um, you know, it, it worked at when it was at its best in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we can all come back together again someday. I agree 100%. I, I got to ask you something about your dad. Garden Party, you know, there's always been kind of misconceptions about what that song's about. I heard that the reason that there was booing is because there were some cops that were getting booed, and it it wasn't, you know, at your dad, but your dad thought, it, he was being booed at. Is that true, or what was the real story there? Well, I think the funny part is that that counter rumor, right, it was promoted by people that were at the show that felt guilty because they turned on our dad. Okay, and 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 the truth was, no. I mean, they turned on our dad. Oh, they did. Turn, they did. They definitely they did. did. Okay. They def- they definitely did. And okay. I think what happened, and even there might even be some truth to both sides of that, because even if there was a little, I mean, we're talking about this is, you know, Madison Square Garden, the right. big hall. So if there were cops in there taking somebody out, you know, okay, you're going to probably get booing from 30 people. Right. But it became contagious, and the whole place went up because he was singing Bob Dylan songs. He had long hair, and he was doing new songs they hadn't heard before. And it was an oldie show. They were they're expecting to see 50s television, black and white Ricky Nelson. <laughs> yeah. And he was doing something contemporary. Right. You know? And it was when he went into the Honky Tonk Woman, which he had just covered, which was a new Rolling Stone song. Right. That's when it started. Mm. So whether it was divine intervention, which I completely believe in, because our dad had spent his entire life being who he thought everybody wanted him to be, and he had just put that band together, really believed in it, and it was kind of like they were shoving it back in his face. That's how he felt. Right. But but he definitely cut his set short and went backstage. Huh. And let's just say this: if that's the truth, then why was it that all of those people were backstage to come and see him and stuff like that? Everybody was too embarrassed to come back and say hi to him. Yeah. All the people he, he said he talked about in the song, you know, and uh, so I talked to him, and I guess that's all that matters is mm-hmm. what my dad told me, which is they absolutely turned on me. Wow. And uh, he said, and I was two weeks later, I was feeling pretty bummed out mm-hmm. about it, and he said he got this song that was playing in his head, like it was completely done. And he he wrote it down on a piece of paper. You can see on the back of the album now. It's like one piece of legal paper with a coffee cup stain on it. Whatever he didn't want to get up, he wrote all the way around a piece of paper. And he heard the ending in his head. Heard I mean, it was like a, it was like a stereo was playing in his head. And that was what became Garden Party. Yeah. And the chorus of it, you know. 
know, oh, right now I've learned my lesson well. You can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. And I guess there's a real power in that, especially from that guy, you know, who was in the States. He was so beautiful and one of the, the first, you know, what they credited the term teen idol for, even mm-hmm. though he was more than that. You know, he was so misunderstood that he got to a point in his life, I'm so glad he drew that line in a song, saying, well, I'm going to do what I do, and I love it. If you like it, great. If you don't, happy trails. Yeah. I'm going to do it anyways. And I think it was one of the, the coolest comebacks because it was a monster hit song at a time where people had mm-hmm. largely forgotten about him as a commercial uh, viability. Uh, but I think more than anything, it was a spiritual uh, standing that he had to make, mm-hmm. and I'm glad that he made that in his life. Um, I always say after being every, you know, who everybody wanted him to be, he wanted to let him know who he was, and he got that chance. I mean, for me as a songwriter, I can honestly say uh, that I have a skill set to write songs. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing with it. I've written with lots of people all over the world. I've written hits, all that. But I can still say here after all of these years that it doesn't come from me. Mm-hmm. Whatever I whatever I create is divine. It comes from somewhere else. Yeah. You know, so yeah. whether, you know, you believe in, in God or a God or whatever it is, I'm just telling you from me and my standpoint that, that it comes from somewhere else. So to me, it's proof more than us. And um, I think our dad really tapped into that with that song. I'm so proud of him for it. It was meant to happen. I mean, that whole, that whole incident was meant to happen so he can write this song. Yeah. No accidents, yeah. right? No accidents. That was definitely yeah. made, you know, and still here we are years later talking about it. It was like a legendary moment in rock history. And uh, I'm really glad that our pop got a chance just to let everybody know, you know, he wasn't going to be 16 forever. Yeah. But it always it always kind of confused me, the, the, the lyrics, because I, I, I wasn't for sure, you know, why were they booing him? You know what I mean? I, I, I kind of thought it was the new songs. But then, then I heard this story about the cops were arresting somebody and this and that. And so I, I, it, I feel better now. It's all cleared up. <laughs> it was that, but it was actually simpler than that. If you really want to know the, the real truth, I mean, the songs were definitely ice on the cake, but the cake was the fact that he came out there with long hair. Right. And kind of a, in a, Didn't you look know, the same. like yeah. with that kind of country rock cowboy look. And they wanted, honestly, that guy they saw in Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. They grew up singing, you know, poor little fool. Right. You know, they wanted that, and they didn't get, they got, they got reimaginings of those songs. I mean, at that time, Randy Meisner, who went on to, you know, co-found the Eagles, was right. in his band, and, right. you know, it was, you know, Tom Brumley on steel guitar. I mean, it was a kind of a contemporary thing for that era, and they really didn't want him, who they thought really symbolized that era that the 60s stole, go up and let everybody know, no, it's okay, the world still is going to move on, even though you don't want it to. It was more of a look thing, he mm-hmm. said. It's, you know, the blessing and the curse of being a, a television guy is that, you know, you had so many critics that didn't want to give him the nod as being the real deal, and you had a lot of his fans that never wanted him to grow up and, like, have a family and grow his hair long, you know? So I think it was kind of that perfect storm of, of a situation that lent itself to one of the, I think, uh, proclamations in rock history. Yeah. I thought it was a great transition when, when he did that. I thought he, I thought he was cool. I always thought he was cool. Whatever he did, <laughs> you know. Yeah, he, he was, and and I gotta say that no, no matter what the era, he always he always cared about everything. He cared yeah. about the music. He cared about. He never phoned in a show ever. He did over three hundred days on the on the year, on the road every mm-hmm. year. I mean, I know because he had to. He had kids in public, you know, private school. Or, you know, he had uh, bills to pay and all that stuff, but more than anything, he loved playing for people. And uh, I'll tell you what, 2020 would have really been, oh, crap, even though he would have been, you know, 80 years old, mm-hmm. he, he absolutely would be out there playing. I'd probably be playing with him, and he wouldn't know what to do with himself because yeah. he was really about getting in front of people and performing. Oh, yeah. He's a pretty good actor, too, man. He, you know, I loved uh, Rio Bravo. I mean, that was a great movie. Still is, man. I come around all the time, and I just, yeah. it was so, so cool, you know, and, uh, yeah, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, you know, I always joke and say, I don't, you know, I look at all those old pictures from the 1800s, and cowboys didn't look that pretty, but, uh, <laughs> he still pulled it off, and, uh, you know, what a great film, what a great picture, and, uh, you know, it's not that we have that. I mean, I will say this, when, when you're fortunate enough 
to be an entertainer and actually mm-hmm. be in, in motion pictures. The nice thing about that is they keep coming around all the time. And people keep, you know, they can visit with you. Songs, if they're really monster hit songs, are the same way. But, you know, there's something really powerful about being in a really good movie. And uh, he did a great job. And, yeah, I guess that's what it was, too. He really spent an awful lot of time on a, sta- on a sound stage. He was a naturally gifted actor. It started when he was very young. But his heart and soul were in, in the music. That's what he wanted to do. And it was, a, yeah. you know, arguably a much harder life, you know. So, you know, you're not sequestered in your your own little, you know, bedroom on the sound stage and, you know, hey, we need you on set, put on your makeup, whatever. It's 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 not like that when you're on the road. I mean, everything from bad food to bad people to, uh, as we saw, you know, mm-hmm. travel dangers and things like that. The bottom line is you, you have to be willing to, to do something that you think is bigger than yourself for the people that think need you. Mm-hmm. And that's what he was about. How cool is it, though, to, you know, just watch an episode and watch your dad since he was young, <laughs> you know, you don't have to take videos, you know, you can't, you don't have to look for old pictures of them or anything. <laughs> Just No, it's, it's true. I, I mean, <laughs> I'll go further than that. You know, I have a six year old little boy. Uh-huh. I named him after my grandfather. So his name is Ozzy and Ozzy, is just the sweetest kid ever, and he's completely bit music bug. He plays drums and guitar and sings. He chills my phone, and he, quote, writes songs, you know, come and hum something that he's gotten. You know, he's totally bitten by it. Loves uh, classic rock is his thing. And he loves to listen to Grandpa Rick. And if he wants to learn about his family, I put on an episode of the show or yep. play one of my pop songs and That's tell awesome. a story about it yeah. or whatever. So we're really, I got to say, I, I would give anything to have my dad here for five more minutes. I really would. Yeah. But um, especially now that I have my own kid and wish, you know, I always saw him uh, as a silver fox, you know, bouncing my kid on his knee. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the truth is I'm very lucky to have so much documentation. Sure. Uh, it's a little, it's a little cold and sterile, but it's something. And, uh, we've been restoring the Ozzy and Harriet show in 4K high def, and oh, it's cool. going to be ready by the end of the year, right. uh, for the world. We're going to release it to everybody and talk about something. I mean, you've never seen it look this good. It's almost creepy. It's almost like, uh, I know it's two dimensional, but it scared me the first time I saw it because it was like they were there. And um, I'm really happy about that project for posterity's sake, you know, because in this day and age, once it's out there, it's forever. And I figure that it's it's time that we give, you know, Ozzy and Harriet and as much as we can as a family's contribution to uh, America first and the world second. Mm-hmm. Will, will they have all the uh, the older episodes in color like they did I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke, you think? Well, in 66, the last show, they did it in color. Right. And and it just didn't have it. Yeah. I'm going to be really honest with you. I mean, we could colorize, and we all talked about it. And it's almost like there's a difference between, you know, doing a completely different remix of a master of a song that you like and a, and a, and a remastering job. The difference is final EQ and a polish, and the other is a complete redo of it. And, you know, we'll probably do a couple of episodes in color and test them, but for, from my standpoint... I just don't think it's as charming as mm-hmm. it is in black and white. Right. But I know that you have a you know generations of people that that, that immediately they see black and white they go I'm not watching that that's that's way too old school. But <laughs> they're really missing out because I think there's a real art. I mean, to this day, I still kind of like the look of a black and white photo more than a color one. Me too. But, uh, yeah. You know, I think it's kind of like your brain has to kind of fill in the dots a little bit. And and so I think we might test it a little bit, but as of now, we really don't have any plans of, like, say, colorizing the entire thing. We're, we're, we're not going to do the whole Ted Turner thing, mm-hmm. you know. I just think it, it, it something gets lost in the translation to me. It's funny. A lot of the young kids that have seen I Love Lucy colorized, they had no idea where it was red. <laughs> uh, right? I know. It, it's very weird. It's yeah. like uh, a lot of people said, it, it, not so much with our family, you know, I mean, you know, our pop did have really dark hair and, mm-hmm. and everybody kind of looked the way that they did and yep. it worked okay it's just I think when you think about the timing of things it was just time to move on you know it was 435 episodes is an awful lot of episodes and and everybody really did it's, it's double what most shows do mm-hmm. in the same amount of time and I don't think there are any live action sitcoms that have gone that long um, but it was just time to move forward and mm-hmm. the world has already done that I mean they wound up leaving the sound stage right in the middle of the, you know, right for the summer of love. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah. When you're on a sound stage, it's really easy to kind of stay frozen in that in that era, almost a little bit of, you know, pleasant pill. And uh, I think that 
kind of happened a little bit. I mean, dad was a, a rock and roller, but mm-hmm. always had to come back and put the sweater on on Monday. <laughs> and, um, and it's really the truth. Got a letter from ABC, uh, from 1958 uh-huh. or 57. And it was, uh, hey, congratulations on Ricky's success as a singer. We heard, uh, we heard that he's going to leaving for the little time and just wanted to let you know we wish him nothing but success, but if he leaves, we're canceling the show. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> oh, and so it was, you know, here you are, you're 17, 18 years old, and yeah. you're faced with, okay, do I follow my own path and this is what I want to do, or do I allow them to fire my parents and the 30 people that work on the show for the last 10 years? Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he made some sacrifices too. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, I applaud him for that, and I'm, again, I'm really glad that he had a kind of a phase after that. He really got to, you know, he didn't sell as many, you know, he didn't sell half a billion records with a Stone Canyon band, but at least he had that moment, those years where it was, it was his songs and his vision, and and you know, he was a man's man and stood up and did that. And there weren't there weren't a whole lot of people from that era that really did that. Mm-hmm. If you can, if you think about it, you know, That's made true. that kind of a definitive, yeah, you know, re, you know, rebirth is with her with her art. Yeah, I, I mean, him and Elvis pretty much from the fifties. You know, that's about it. In my yeah, opinion. and Elvis pretty much had the six, you know the sixty nine comeback special, yeah. and then he went to Vegas. Yep. You know, and uh, Pop was offered a huge deal in Las Vegas and, and turned it down. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He turned it down. He said, "Look, you know, the first thing was, as I said, he was really close to Elvis, and he went to go see Elvis." Uh, a few months before he passed away right. as his guest. And uh, I talked to the band that was with him there. You know, they're playing kind of in town. and They couldn't find my dad. They found him on the loading dock with a cigarette in his hand crying. Hmm. And he said, he looked at everybody and he just said, guys, don't ever let it happen to me. Please, God, don't ever let them do that to me. Right. You know, I mean, it was, it was hard. Really, it was impossible. He couldn't watch it. Yeah. Because, you know, and you have to admit, it was, it was hard to watch. It was. And, yeah. You know, Elvis will always be the king. I have nothing but respect, and I'm an Elvis fan mm-hmm. and stuff. But you got to, you know, as just a, as a as a man, like just talking to you right now, you know, somebody should have just grabbed him and said, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um. Yeah, he had the Memphis Mafia him. just kind of hanging on with him, you know, just. I don't know. If yeah. they, I don't know if they were a good thing or a bad thing, you know? I really don't. Right, 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 right. You know, um. So, um, you know, our dad till the end, and maybe it was, I don't know, uh, I heard about the money that they offered him to do in Vegas, and mm-hmm. it was turned down, and it would have been the answer to yeah. any kind of financial issue. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I guess, you, whether or not you look at it, either to his salvation or his detriment, he turned it down. Yeah, he would have been great. He would have been great in Vegas, you know? I'm sorry, what was that? He would have been, he would have been fantastic in Vegas, you know? He would have. He just, yeah. uh, you know, Vegas back then in the seventies was really, you know, he called them fans and feathers, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. uh, he just couldn't do it. Uh, um, it was kind of milk toasting down what he loved about music in general. And I don't know, you know, again, I was just, I was just a kid. Um, if I were, if I were older, I probably would. Uh, and you know, Vegas again, super different in the seventies than what everybody, you know, what it became. But you know, this this juggernaut of kinds of tech and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just wasn't the right time. And I kind of, looking back on it now, I kind of get it. You know, it had a it had a stigma, a real stigma. And uh, Elvis could pull it off because he was the king and the colonel had him set up there at the International. And, and it was basically, you know, Vegas was Elvis' town. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he was, you know, part of it too was when he was offered the job, it was right after Elvis had passed away. And he just said, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, for a lot of reasons, you know, for spiritual reasons and for, you know, every reason you could, he just said, I, I the money's not worth it. I, I know for me, it would end all my problems and it'd be great. And I, it's not really, you just show up, you play a show and go back to your hotel room. But, you know, think about that. You know, it, it, that also has its problems too. You know, it, it's like the Groundhog Day thing for years. That can, um, I got it. You know, I'd love to talk to some people that have been in theaters there for that long to talk about how they keep their sanity. You know. Mm-hmm. You know, man. Yeah, a- a- actually, yeah. actually, you and Gunner would be good in Vegas. <laughs> you know that? Been, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. We've been people <laughs> talk to us about it, and and I don't know. I mean, um, 
we've played in Vegas at certain places or whatever, but you know, everybody there now is is all about production shows. Right. You know. Well, you can it's do like, that. <laughs> we, we can do it. You know, it's yeah. like it's like you see these presentations and you talk to them and then they're like, and this is where the lions come in. It's like, what? <laughs> you, you what? So I don't know. You know, you never say never, but uh, you know, I mean, Gunner and I had an idea. We had a Christmas hit with a song we wrote called This Christmas uh-huh. a couple of years ago. Right. And we did a double duet with our friends Carney and Buddy Wilson. You know, Brian Wilson's kids from Wilson sure, Phillips. And sure. it was kind of basically a new Mamas and the Papas, mm-hmm. what we put together with them. And our singing together was, and we looked great together, and it was highbrow and upscale and really awesome, and they're beautiful ladies and really fun. And we thought, well, we did it is something that we could put together in, you know, one of the bigger lounges in Vegas and have a great time, you know? And I'm never saying never. It's just that they're very big ladies, and Gunner and I kind of have a different, but we used to, especially when we were touring a lot. You know, Gunner and I, we played a lot. Mm-hmm. We toured a lot. We were doing, you know, 150, 200 shows a year yeah. up until this COVID thing. So, yeah. um, and and they, they kind of don't. You know, they stay home with their families and, and stuff like that. So, I'm never going to say never, but that's probably how I would do something if I had, you know, a magic wand is, is do something where we could put together a really fun, just kind of visit with our friends review and kind of have a little bit of that, um, that rock and roll legacy thing going in a fun way. You know, I think that would be kind of a neat thing. And frankly, I, I'd pay to see that show. You know, there's also, uh, Branson. Have you played Branson? Yeah, I played Branson yeah. before a couple of times. And again, it, we faced kind of what our dad faced uh-huh. in, in Vegas. Right. You know, there was really no Branson when our dad was, was around. But right. um, it's a similar thing because there's kind of a little bit of a, this is what is expected in a Branson show kind of thing. And yeah, I guess we could, you know, change stuff around to kind of fit that that idea of what the show is. But it really just depends on whether or not you, you feel authentic mm-hmm. doing that and mm-hmm. I'm not looking down I mean we, we had really great show success there but we just did our show yeah. but if you planned it there they kind of want you to do more of again kind of a Branson production kind of thing and right, right. you know I, I still think that Gunner and I right now especially with our first sons project we're, we're just not as much as we, you know, everybody has, you know, you got to make a living and all that kind of stuff, but we're just not done. Yeah. You know, we're not finished yet. And the one thing I got to say about what we've done up until this, this COVID era is every day is different. Even, mm-hmm. even if we play the same venue, we're coming back at a different time. We've had to travel there. We've had life experience. It's a different crowd. Every day feels like an adventure mm-hmm. to me, you know, and I love that feeling of like, you know, waking up in the morning and, you know, saying, all right, God, what do you got for me today? Bring it on. You know, I love that. And I think that just kind of planting myself someplace uh, for too long. I mean, when I have done, uh, like, say, you know, a couple of weeks on a cruise ship, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to tell you, I kind of hate it. Really? You know, I've done done it enough now to where, uh, you know, there were reasons why we we did them for a while and stuff. And we knew some people at Royal Caribbean. And Uh the shows were always great. And, you know, it's a captive audience that doesn't pay. And, you know, people were impressed. And it was fun and great and stuff. And it was just kind of like feeling like, you know, dance monkey. You know, it's kind of what it felt like a little bit too much. And and so um, I kind of just don't want to do a lot of stuff that makes me feel like that. Yeah. Well, you actually got... You, you have a, a cruise scheduled, right? In, in uh, next year, in October? The, uh, yeah, that's different. That's, that's like a one-off kind of thing, and, and right. I love that. I'm talking more of like you're a semi-contract player. You know, you're okay. out for two or three weeks, and you're doing yeah. two shows a week and, and staying on there. It's kind of like being in the Navy. This mm-hmm. is different. That's the, the thing you're talking about is like we have like the old cruise. We've done, yeah, the you know, we've done hard rock cruises, stuff like that. Right. Um, and we, we like that because that's, that's more – I look at that more as like an extended – you know, gig. It's like one show, you just happen to be out for a few days. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you can visit with people. So I like those. I just yeah. don't like the whole thing where, you know, you're on there for two or three, and we've been on like four cruises in a row, and that's just like, right. okay, yeah. I've been around the Caribbean, I want to go home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> well, so you got, you're got you working, uh, you said you had a new album coming out? Yeah, we, we actually do. Okay. Um, it's, it's called Firstborn Sons. All right. And it's going to be out at the beginning of next year, and okay. it's a country rock project. 
We also have a definitive Nelson greatest hits yep. coming out next year. Okay. Which is universal. Awesome. Um, we have, uh, I think, another album that we haven't released yet that Universal wants to release at the, uh, the end of 2021. And uh, I think we have three different releases on Universal. That's basically who wound up with our label, Geffen. Mm-hmm. And um, we're excited about that. We're excited about kind of renewing an interest in, in our legacy stuff that we've done and kind of moving forward with something new. There's also world. there's also a remaster of um, After the Rain, correct? Uh, celebrating the 1990 multi-platinum debut masterpiece. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, we, I yep. actually um, went in and got a chance to remaster the album with a great engineer at the awesome. Capitol Tower. Good. And um, it, it, it sounds brilliant. It's so much better than it was just because it's 30 years later Analog to digital technology has made, you know, huge advances, mm-hmm. and it just sounds, you know, like he, the big analog tapes did in the studio when we made it that got lost in that translation just due to technology. Mm-hmm. And I'm so proud of it. We, we actually even released it on a 180-gram uh, audiophile vinyl release. And uh, now when you turn on anything on, on the radio or whatever, hopefully they service this enough that it's, it's those new masters that people are hearing of. Love and affection after the rain more than yep. ever, and only time will tell. Excellent. And of course, your I guess your last release was Peace Out. That's also available. You can buy that on Amazon or probably on your website as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you, you, wait, you can definitely find that. I think the, the best way, we're all over the internet. We're yep. not hard to find at all. One thing that I've been doing, I've gotten so many people asking, hey, can we buy some t-shirts or whatever? Mm-hmm. So we've got some nostalgia shirts, you know, kind of going back 30 years ago that we're reissuing. Uh, online. Uh, that's going to be launched, I believe, this week. And also some new designs. And then with our other projects, I mean, I get a chance to oversee you know, Ricky Nelson, Ozzy and Harriet, mm-hmm. and Firstborn Sons, as far as all that stuff is concerned. So, for anybody that wants to go down the Nelson rabbit hole, we've got plenty for you to look at. Yep, www.matthewandgunnernelson.com That's your website. Nice and short. Exactly. Yeah. And of <laughs> course, you're on Facebook, yeah. Instagram, and YouTube, and I'm going to share those links as well with everybody. Oh, thank you very much. Awesome. Matt, Matt, I want to thank you, man, for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure. We'll, we'll follow up with you after the show, after the uh, the new album's out. Um, oh, great. It's fantastic. Sometime first You'll be quarter. the first to get it. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, all the great success to you and your, your, your two brothers. Your other brother also sings, right? I, allegedly, yeah, I haven't heard a whole lot from him in a long time. He's just kind of going underground. He does more of a kind of an alternative rock kind of thing when he sings, but he's very talented. Yep. I mean, what a what a talented family you guys have had. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I, w- I wish yeah, I could have uh, just a piece of that. <laughs> well, we're really lucky, and it kind of it always makes for interesting Christmas dinners. That's for sure. Definitely, you know? definitely. Well, we love you guys. Uh, you Thank know, you. love the legacy of the Nelsons. And, uh, you know, take care out there. Be safe. Oh, you got it. And you too. And uh, we'll definitely catch you all when it, uh, when it does settles a little bit. We'll get out there and play some live music for everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. All right you bye. too. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio, Station 1.